You're listening to the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Oliver Conway and this edition is published in the early hours of Thursday the 29th of June. New clashes are reported in France a day after the police killing of a teenager in Paris. The US Coast Guard says it's found presumed human remains from the wreckage of the Titan submersible. And Madonna postpones her upcoming Celebration World Tour after being hospitalised with a serious bacterial infection. Also in the podcast, the Chinese vlogger who managed to convince followers he was a Russian soldier in Ukraine. And... Working nine to five, what a way to make a living, barely getting by. Why celebrity lookalikes are angry with Facebook. A day after protests in Paris over the killing of a 17-year-old boy by a police officer, there's been unrest in the capital again and other parts of France. In the southern city of Toulouse, clouds of black smoke filled the air as cars and barricades were set on fire. Footage posted on social media showed police trying to clear demonstrators with tear gas. There were also clashes in Lille and a rally in Nantes where a large group of marchers chanted justice for Nahel, the teenager shot dead during the traffic stop on Tuesday. The authorities deployed 2,000 riot police to try to prevent a repeat of the trouble on Tuesday night, which left 24 police officers injured and saw 31 arrests. The worst of the unrest was in the Paris suburb of Nanterre, where the 17-year-old, known only as Nahel, was killed. The accused officer has been detained. The French parliament held a minute silence on Wednesday, while politicians, including President Macron, condemned the killing. We have an adolescent who... A teenager has been killed. It's inexplicable, unforgivable. And first of all, these are words of affection, shared sorrow and support for his family and loved ones. Secondly, the case was immediately referred to the courts. I hope that they will carry out their work quickly, of course, with the calm that this work requires and that the truth can be established as soon as possible. So is that swift condemnation from the government likely to calm the anger? Hugh Schofield is our Paris correspondent. Yes, in the sense that it, it won't do the opposite. An ill-chosen word at this juncture could certainly have made things an awful lot worse. What's very striking is how quickly President Macron has, in a way, sidestepped the usual rhetoric about letting justice take its course and so on, but come in very, very quickly to side with the family and to say that it's inexcusable the attack. The police unions are angry, saying, hang on a sec, let's find out all the facts in the case. But undoubtedly, that message and the message from other from ministers in the government will have been one which is a aimed at appeasing and trying to calm things down on the ground. Now, last year, a record 13 people were killed in traffic stops in France, fewer this year. But might this incident force changes on the police? Well, it's a big debate. It's quite possible that President Macron will say, yes, we need to address this. I mean, what's happened is that there was a big change in the rules allowing French police a greater latitude to open fire. That was in response to the pressure they felt that they were under. They've also been stepping up an awful lot the number of traffic stops they do and the bid to cut down on drug crime. And so, yes, last year we thought 13 people killed who were refusing to, to obey police instructions at a traffic stop. It is regarded universally as far too many. Even the police unions say we want clearer rules. Hugh Schofield in Paris. And after we spoke to Hugh, we heard that there'd been another night of unrest in Nanterre with protesters shooting fireworks at police and setting cars ablaze. There was also trouble in Amiens and Dijon. A man has been arrested in Ukraine on suspicion of helping direct a Russian missile strike in the eastern city of Kramatorsk. Eleven people died and more than 60 people were wounded in the attack, which destroyed a pizza restaurant. Ukraine says the city, some 40 kilometres from the front line, was hit by an Iskander ballistic missile, one of the most accurate weapons in Russia's arsenal. The Russian Defence Ministry has again said it only attacks military targets. From Kramatorsk, here's our correspondent, Andrew Harding. Rescue workers were still clambering over the wreckage of a popular restaurant here in Kramatorsk, cutting away concrete, searching for survivors and for bodies. All day, tearful friends and relatives stood waiting outside in the rain for news. The Russian missile hit last night, 
Video footage showed shocked and bleeding civilians trying to help each other. My daughter is still inside. Her name is Irina, said this woman. Later, we heard she'd been rescued. But twin 14-year-old sisters Yulia and Anna Asenchenko both died. The Rear Lounge is one of the few restaurants still open in Kramatorsk. We just, we just got shelled. One filmed herself moments after the explosion. Since then, Ukraine's security services have announced the arrest of a local man they've accused of being a Russian agent. They said he'd filmed the restaurant hours before the attack and sent the information and location to Russia's military. Kramatorsk, a big industrial city, has been hit repeatedly by Russian airstrikes. A local medic, Ilya Gamash, was helping this latest rescue effort. Rescuers are busy clearing the rubble. They are looking for the remaining people who may still be underneath. Their fate, whether they are alive or not, unfortunately is not yet known. An air raid siren started up again, but the rescuers continue to dig through the rubble. Andrew Harding reporting from Kramatorsk. Meanwhile, some of NATO's frontline states are calling for the organization's eastern border to be strengthened following the aborted mutiny in Russia on Saturday. Latvia, Lithuania and Poland all border Belarus, which has offered safe haven to the Wagner mercenaries involved in the rebellion. Lithuanian president Gitanas Nauseda said he was very concerned. If Wagner deploys its serial killers in Belarus, all neighboring countries face even greater danger of instability. Under such circumstances, deterrence and forward defense is a top priority. After the uprising, Wagner mercenaries were told they could go to Belarus, return to their families or join the regular Russian armed forces. But predictions the group will be disbanded appear premature, as our Eastern Europe correspondent Sarah Rainsford reports from Warsaw. Days after the Wagner group staged a mutiny that Vladimir Putin claimed was so dangerous it could have sparked civil war, the group is still recruiting fighters to its ranks from across Russia. We called hotlines in multiple cities and they all confirmed that it's business as usual. Sign up and get deployed immediately, including to Ukraine, and now, several told us, to Belarus. They stressed that the contracts were with the Wagner Group, not the Russian Defence Ministry. No change there. No one we spoke to thinks Evgeny Prigozhin's army is being disbanded. At least, not for now. That said, there has been no sign yet of any significant movement of troops to Belarus. But the very prospect has worried countries close by, including Poland, who fear even more instability on their doorstep and want NATO to think about extra protection measures on its eastern flank. The words of this man who posts on a Wagner Telegram channel may explain their concern. We're still working, we've gone nowhere, he insists, of the Wagner group. The distance from the Belarusian border to Kiev is less than 300 kilometers. If the Russian Defense Ministry entered Belarus and tried to enter Ukraine from the north, They'd need a reason. But now the whole of NATO is in shock and the Poles are going crazy. There is a lot still unclear about the Wagner Group's fate, including that of its leader Evgeny Prigozhin, who hasn't been heard of since Monday. Yesterday, the Belarusian president said he was there. But that same evening, Prigozhin's private jet left the country. And according to flight tracking data, it headed back to Russia, first to Moscow and then to Prigozhin's hometown, St. Petersburg. Sarah Rainsford in Warsaw. A man from the Chinese province of Hernan, meanwhile, has managed to convince some 400,000 fans that he is a Russian soldier using AI technology. The man claimed to be from the Chechen Special Forces and said he was serving on the front line in Ukraine. He was exposed after his computer location gave him away. I heard more details from our China media analyst, Kerry Allen. To give you an idea of some of the posts, one video, he's standing in front of a nuclear power plant and he says, I'm in Ukraine and the Russian army have just taken over this area. He also, in other posts, he's standing in the countryside in Henan province, which is in central China. He's wearing camo and he's got a bald head and a beard and he's talking about how he's been battling US Marines and he's even shown a handgun in one video. So people have really bought into the idea that this is someone on the front line 
line in Ukraine, not in central China. And did these posts look realistic? I mean, how did he manage to convince people he was, in fact, a Russian soldier? People were convinced because he used AI technologies to transform his face. In China, it's very rare to see somebody with a long beard, and he's got the appearance of one in this video. And he does speak with an accent. Of course, though, there are people from Henan province who were watching this saying, hang on a minute, this sounds like a guy who's putting on a Russian accent. We can hear his Chinese accent coming through. But he racked up hundreds of thousands of followers. So clearly, a number of people in China did think he was actually a Russian soldier. And not only that, they also bought items from him. He hosted an e-commerce website and was selling imported Russian goods, vodka and honey. And people believed that he was doing this from Russia, not from China. And how was his deception uncovered? It's interesting because... China, within the last few months, has introduced a number of rules so that social media users, when they're posting claims about places, their IP location is shown. So, for example, if I started posting on Sina Weibo, China's equivalent of Twitter, it would show that I'm from the UK. So users who've been following this man, they've started seeing an IP location under his Douyin account, Douyin being Chinese TikTok, and they've seen that his posts are coming from Henan not from Ukraine. Our China media analyst, Kerry Allen. In the past hour, it's emerged that the team recovering pieces of the Titan submersible that imploded in the North Atlantic have found suspected human remains. Five people were on board the vessel when it broke up. Parts of the sub, including the nose and a side panel, have been recovered from the ocean floor near the wreck of the Titanic and brought ashore near Canada. With the latest, here's our correspondent, Peter Bowes. In a statement, the Coast Guard said medical professionals would conduct a formal analysis of presumed human remains that have been recovered within the wreckage. Debris from the sea floor is now being examined by investigators from several international jurisdictions with the hope of determining the cause of the accident. It includes large pieces of metal resembling parts of the Titan's white hull and landing skids designed for touching down on the seabed. The Coast Guard said there was still a substantial amount of work to be done to understand what led to the catastrophic loss of the Titan and to ensure a similar tragedy does not occur again. The collection of evidence is continuing, along with interviews with those closely involved with the submersible's mission ahead of a public inquiry into the tragedy. The Titan is believed to have imploded around the time it lost communication, killing all five people on board. Peter Bowes reporting. Madonna's upcoming world tour has been postponed after she was admitted to intensive care with a serious bacterial infection. A US newspaper is reporting that the 64-year-old star had to be rushed to hospital after being found in an unresponsive condition. From Los Angeles, our correspondent Sophie Long has the latest. What we know, according to her manager, is that on Saturday, Madonna developed what he called a serious bacterial infection, which led to her spending several days in the intensive care unit. Now, we are told that her health is improving and that she is expected to make a full recovery, which is good news. But at the moment, we are told she is still undergoing medical care. And so as a result, her team has decided to suspend all commitments, which of course includes the celebration tour. Now, the tour was scheduled to kick off in Vancouver next month, and it's to mark the 40th anniversary of her breakout single holiday. And it was much anticipated when tickets went on sale 98 percent of them sold out immediately with fans buying up 600,000 tickets in one day. We are told that when she released the video announcing the tour she uh, said to her fans that she was really looking forward to exploring as many songs as possible and giving her fans the show that they've been waiting for and they've been waiting a while. It was 2016 that was her last major arena tour with Rebel Heart. Well it seems tonight that they are going to be waiting just a little bit longer. Sophie Long in Los Angeles. In 2019, the world of K-pop was rocked by revelations that some of the biggest stars of the Korean music industry had abused women and secretly filmed themselves having sex with them before sharing videos in a group chat. Singer Jung Joon Young was convicted of rape, while fellow artist Sung Ni was found guilty of misappropriating funds and procuring sex workers for business investors. A new podcast from the BBC's Intrigue series is taking a deeper look at those scandals. I spoke to the presenter of Burning Sun, Chloe Hajimatheu. 
these were huge stars. Sung Lee was a singer with Big Bang, which, when it was at its prime, was probably one of the most popular boy bands in the world. And Jung Joon Young, whose telephone uh, a lot of these chats were found, was a massive TV star on one of the most popular shows in Korea. And the thing that was really shocking for people in Korea and really from around the world was the fact that these people had incredibly clean-cut images, really wholesome images. They were singing music that was loved by young girls all around the world. And really, behind the scenes, there was just this terrible, sordid abuse going on. And take us through a couple of the the key moments in the podcast. So what's been really fascinating is how this investigation unraveled. And I mean, it was just one of those things that's so unlikely to happen. I mean, what are the chances that someone is going to get hold of a superstar's mobile phone But a whistleblower did exactly do that. They managed to get hold of this celebrity's phone and saw this terrible abuse on it and managed to get it to the authorities. But the media also picked up on this. The main reporter who brought the story out was an entertainment reporter. She'd never done anything like this. And taking on these celebrities who were really big names was really, really daunting. I was expecting to see one secretly filmed sex video I wasn't prepared for how much was on there. The conversations being exchanged between Chung and his friends were as if they were collecting trophies, uh, sending each other messages like, I did this to this woman, I'm the winner today. And what have you found out while looking into this in more detail? I think what was really interesting after spending quite a lot of time in Korea, several trips, was understanding how this story played into the wider picture in Korea. There have been many other scandals with illegal spy cam pornography and all kinds of other abuse of women going on in Korea. Very high profile scandals that have happened over the last few years. Korean women have become very angry and there's been a strong feminist movement that was sparked by Me Too but continued on. Chloe Hadjimathayu. Still to come on the Global News Podcast. We are creating the first international sports event without drug testing. We expect that all of the world records will be obliterated at the first enhanced games. The controversial plan to hold a rival to the Olympics where doping is allowed. A former U.S. Marine accused of placing a homeless man in a deadly chokehold on a New York subway has pleaded not guilty to criminal charges. Daniel Penny was filmed restraining Jordan Neely by the neck. The case has attracted widespread attention across the U.S. Here's our North America correspondent, Jessica Parker. In May, Jordan Neely got on the Manhattan subway where, according to the district attorney's office, he began making verbal threats. Prosecutors allege that's when Daniel Penny put Mr Neely into a chokehold for several minutes, including after his body stopped moving. The 24-year-old former Marine has pleaded not guilty to second-degree manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. He's previously said he acted to protect other passengers. Family of Jordan Neely, who was a former Michael Jackson in person, Fascinator, have said that the 30-year-old had suffered from mental health issues since his mother was strangled to death in 2007. Jessica Parker. An investigation has found that more than 100 political leaders in the US are direct descendants of slaveholders. Reuters journalist Tom Lasseter led the reporting. Of 536 members of the last sitting Congress, we determined at least 100 of those congressional members descended from slaveholders. In addition, President Joe Biden and every living former U.S. president, except for Donald Trump, is a direct descendant of a slaveholder, Jimmy Carter, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and through his white mother's side, Barack Obama. Two of the nine sitting U.S. Supreme Court justices. And then we looked also at governors of the 50 U.S. states, and of those we found that 11 were descendants of slaveholders. We went to them with detailed family trees, and for many dozens of those members of Congress, I carried them by hand to their congressional offices, and the majority of them didn't engage with us. And so it's difficult to know how many of them knew before we got in touch. 
We did a pretty broad national poll on how knowing this information about a politician might affect voters in the polling booth. Almost a quarter of respondents said knowing that a candidate's ancestors enslaved people would make them less likely to vote for the candidate. Tom Lasseter, Reuters journalist. So how surprising are these findings? Laurie Callas has been talking to Dr Brenda E. Stevenson, history professor at the University of Oxford and a world-renowned scholar on slavery. No, I'm not surprised by the numbers that we're talking about. What most people don't understand is that the U.S. had the largest slave society in the mid-19th century in the Americas. And those persons who were slaveholding were the elite. Either that or they were attached to slavery, the institution, financially in some kind of way. So I'm not at all surprised that their descendants would also be elites in our society today. What? Do you think this says maybe about diversity and access in U.S. politics in the modern day? It indicates that U.S. politics today is closely tied to U.S. history. Slavery was a big part of the United States history for most of U.S. history. And even though slavery as an institution has ended in most forms in the United States, the legacy of slavery lives on in many ways, including in our elected officials. Do you think that U.S. politics in general offers a space for discussions about the legacies of slavery to happen? Well, the legacy of slavery is being discussed more and more in political settings because of the reparations movement, for example, and also the instances when people spoke, at least on local and state levels, about Confederate monuments, Confederate flags. But in the U.S. today, we are having a battle over U.S. history and what is taught in the schools and what's not taught. And the fact that we now have this huge trove of information about slavery and its legacy as represented in the governing bodies of the United States is going to, I think, shake that up a little bit. But the lines are drawn and many people don't want to think about that part of America's past. Brenda E. Stevenson talking to Laurie Callas. Millions of people around the world followed the historic case of missing mum Lynette Dawson on the hugely successful Australian podcast Teacher's Pet. On Wednesday, Lynette's husband, Chris Dawson, who was found guilty of her murder last year, was convicted of having a sexual relationship with one of his students, who was 16 at the time. Teacher's Pet won Australian journalism's highest honour and has been downloaded more than 60 million times. James Reynolds got the latest from the journalist behind the podcast, Hedley Thomas. Chris Dawson was today convicted of the charge of carnal knowledge. He had sex with a girl who was under the age of consent and because he was a teacher and she was his student, he faces a number of years of imprisonment. He was found to have groomed her when she was a schoolgirl. He became infatuated with her when he was married to Lynn Dawson and, of course, Lynn was murdered by Chris in January 1982. So this verdict today was a completion of the circle of justice by the schoolgirl who had been a babysitter in the house, was picked out by Chris Dawson on the playground, and he just fell head over heels for her, promised her everything, proposed marriage to her when she was 16, and went on to marry her and have a child with her. Hedley, was it your investigation which led eventually to this conviction? Yes. The judge was told by the detective from the sexual crime squad in Sydney that it was the podcast, The Teacher's Pet, and the revelations from students who talked to me about a sex ring of high school teachers led by Chris Dawson. That led to the formation of a strike force, and that strike force of detectives began talking to a number of the students who had already talked to me tracking down some of the teachers who were accused of this wrongdoing and they went and interviewed the former student Chris Dawson's second wife who wanted to press forward with her claims that she was exploited by him that he had preyed upon her they were divorced in 1990 and 
they have a child together, but she has never had another relationship because the trust issues, being the concerns that the connection she had to Chris Dawson led to the murder of a very loving mother and wife in Lynn. When you began the podcast, did you ever envisage that this would be the consequence in these two convictions? James, I believe that Chris Dawson, at the very start of my podcast investigation, needed to be tried for what I believed was the probable murder of his first wife, Lynn. But I didn't understand that there was this other terrible crime involving a number of high school teachers from numerous schools on the northern beaches of Sydney exploiting 15 and 16 year old schoolgirls for sex, setting them exams on a Friday and then crawling through their bedroom windows for sex on the Saturday. That came as a surprise and it unfolded as the podcast was running because students who were listening, former students, came forward to me and said, we want to get justice for Lynn, but there's this other side to this story, which is really bad and has never been looked at and it's one of the dirty secrets of the northern beaches that these teachers are up to this. Hadley Thomas talking to James Reynolds. Now, how's this for a claim? I am the fastest man in the world. But you've never heard of me. I have broken Usain Bolt's 100 meter record. But I can't show you my face. I am a proud, enhanced athlete. Well, what if athletes could enhance their performance by taking drugs? The Australian entrepreneur Aaron D'Souza is hoping to find out with his controversial plan to launch the Enhanced Games, where anything goes. He wants to see the event involving athletics, gymnastics, swimming, weightlifting and combat sports as early as next year. Mr D'Souza told Sarah Montague about his idea. We are creating the first international sports event without drug testing to show what human excellence is possible through the combination of science and sport. I believe that adults with full and informed consent, they're entitled to make choices for their own body and no government and no paternalistic sports organization should be making those decisions for them. What are you expecting that this will mean in terms of records broken and what the spectator would see? We expect that all of the world records will be obliterated at the first enhanced games. And if they're not, that's a horrible indictment upon the Olympics because that will largely mean that their drug testing regimes are ineffective. What is a common misconception about performance enhancing drugs is that most people think that they are illegal and hard to get. 20% of the products that you would buy at at a GNC or a Holland and Barrett would actually get you dinged under Olympic rules. What about other rules that might apply to the kind of trainers you would wear that could help you? Say you had somebody who had, you know, the blade running, some sort of enhancement. If you're missing the lower limbs, can you compete in the same competitions? I think that would be a very interesting competition to be had. If a disabled individual who's using carbon fiber cybernetic enhancements wants to compete against a fully able individual, I think that'd be very interesting. And you're having male and female categories? We're having male and female categories. And trans are allowed to compete whichever category they want? That's right, because trans people are enhanced human beings. They use many of the same pharmacological compounds to transition gender as enhanced athletes do. And so the question about fairness is very different with trans athletes competing against, in particular, enhanced women. Australia's Olympic chef de mission for Paris next year, Anna Mears, said it's a joke, to be honest. Unfair, unsafe, I just don't think this is the right way to go about sport. This is the response to all disruption. I'm sure Blockbuster Video said the same thing about Netflix, or the taxi cab said the same thing about Uber. This is the story of disruption that happens in our society over and over again. What do athletes think? How many have said, this is great, I'll be competing? I've spoken to over a hundred athletes since we launched five days ago. At least another hundred more have expressed their interest. On our athletes advisory board includes Olympians like Christina Smith, Brett Fraser, and Roland Schumann. So have you got anybody who's actually signed up? Absolutely. It's easy for me to come here and talk to you about criticizing Olympics. It's much harder for athletes to do that because they're worried that they might get their medal stripped off of them, be expunged from the record books. It's a tremendous act of courage for these athletes to be associated with this movement so early. This is not just about athletes, right? This is about all of humanity. Performance medicine, longevity medicine, 
medicine, it's real. And Sarah, if there was a magic pill that made you 20 years younger, that made you run faster, that extended not just your lifespan, but your health span, wouldn't you take it? Aaron D'Souza talking to Sarah Montague. Finally, Dolly Parton, Britney Spears and Taylor Swift appeared to cause quite a scene in London on Wednesday, protesting outside the headquarters of the social media giant 